Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 27th. How'd that happen? <laughs> 2022. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, we want to thank all you guys and girls tonight. We got quite a few of you girls tonight for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm trying to watch my manners <laughs> for the ladies. So, what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading. And uh, your favorite stock in crypto picks, although crypto is in such a bear market, I doubt you'll have any picks unless you want to short them. Just so I don't get confused, if it is a crypto, put a dollar sign in front of it. We'll, we'll look at crypto real quick first when we get the live charts, and then we'll go to the stocks. And I'll have a lot to say about that, obviously. So today we're going to talk about three secrets to trading. And <laughs> when I tell you, you're not going to be too impressed, but then it's like, if you do what I say, I think you will be. Before we get to all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, borrowing a line from my buddy Greg Morris, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So three secrets to trading or document, document, and document. Now, before we get to that, this comes from Trading Full Circle. And I talked about a presentation that Tom McClellan did a few years back at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting. And he was talking about when you buy a stock, you form a relationship between you and the company. But you're also forming a relationship with anyone who bought that stock prior to you. And to quote Tom, he says, and those people will screw you. Now, I think if you look at what's happening in the market and when we look at some of these shorts, and as I said in tonight's service, talking about, I think it was TNDM, you've got a lot of overhead supply, a potential overhead supply. So there's a lot of people that are probably probably be looking to bail out of the market. Let me get my tongue on stuff. I had emailed Tom years ago and told him about that. And he says, well, I got one better for my late mother, Marion. And I've seen and heard this one a thousand times since. Everyone uses timing in their investing. Some people buy when they have money and sell when they need money, while others use methods that are more sophisticated. Now, last week we talked a lot about the pre-mortem. And in the end, I'm going to remind you to go back in and re-watch that presentation. And this week I thought I would really kind of get into the pre-mortem or expound upon it a little bit, but I wanted to touch upon the, the documentation of the trade and a little bit of the pre-mortem going into the trade. Now, thinking about what Tom's mom said, are you buying because you have money? If I'm having a really good trading day, like on the intraday stuff, for instance, I will push the limit a little bit and maybe take an extra setup that I might not have normally taken because I have money. Or are you selling because you need money? Well, a lot of times we do that. And a lot of times, especially if it's the what happened recently to you, let's say you lost money. For instance, I had a really bad day last Friday. Well, Monday, I was a little skittish, especially with all the volatility and all. And it was really hard for me to hold on to these profits because I just wanted to make some money back as quick as I could. I think Monday, Monday was the best day, day of the week so far. Well, I guess we only have one day left. <laughs> but I was a little skittish and thinking about selling on some of these positions because I didn't want to give up the open profits. And of course, it can always be something far more sophisticated. So ask yourself those three things first. Now, a little confession time, and this is why I put this in this week. Are you being goaded? Or more accurately, allow yourself to be goaded because nobody can make you do anything you don't want to do. Now, as I said before, I'm probably one of the last persons in the United States to get around to watching Game of Thrones. But a lot of people told me that I should watch it. and It was entertaining, and it, it was. And my daughter, my adult daughter, uh, visits a couple nights a week because our house is in between 
her work and her house and she spends a couple nights a week here i think she's i think she likes a free food <laughs> anyway we rewatch we tend to rewatch game of thrones with her because she's a, a nerd when it comes to this anyway i i what's her name ira stark is when she i think she could be a good let me start over ira stark i think could be a good trader because one of her lines throughout the movie is that's not me and more importantly or as importantly you should know who you are and more importantly i think is what i'm trying to say you should know who you aren't so in trading you if there's a certain thing but it doesn't fit your psyche even though it works maybe you shouldn't do it because that's not you and the trade i got goaded into yesterday was in a small way and i took it for two reasons one because i had money i had a good day yesterday and i was feeling flush and a, a client who is pretty good at doing these things texted me and said hey tesla's got earnings and i'm thinking to myself that's not me i don't want to get into after hours trading one because i can't use the orders i would normally use i can't use a trailing stop i can't use a stop entry i can't use a protective stop and what happens is i have to sit there and babysit it and it's also a really crazy squirrely way to trade but i took the trade anyway because i had money right i was feeling flush i was feeling smart and i said was i said to myself well this is just be a little cherry on the cake and if it doesn't work out i'm going to sweep it under the rug well it didn't work out and it didn't get hurt too bad but i lost money because i allowed myself to be goaded into a trade and that's a little bit of the fomo and other things like that by the way right before we're live i'm thinking the secret to trading really is just dealing with these issues of trading psychology and wrapping your head around them. And the best way to do it is just to document what you are doing. Now, as far as trading is concerned, your emotional status is very, very important. Are you tired? Are you hungry? And it's interesting that there's been studies done if you start reading about this behavioral science behavioral finance and stuff like that there's been studies done where they look at the sentencing of crimes and if you are convicted of a crime see if you can postpone your sentencing until after lunch because <laughs> it's been shown that judges are much more lenient after lunch than before lunch well that's because they are hungry and there's been a lot of studies done on this and i saw one of them recently and it was pretty fascinating that if you get sentenced before lunch your chances of getting a much harsh harsher or sentence are greatly increased now this one doesn't seem like it would be a negative thing but are you in a fantastic mood and i've been bouncing off the walls and coming here and feeling great about everything and then my reaction to what i should do in the markets is probably a little too free and easy and the market humbles me and that puts me back not not to a normal state but actually below a normal state now on the flip side are you pissed off are you gun shy or a little skittish on monday i was a little skittish coming in after a really bad friday and thinking about it all weekend and also the volatility of the market has gone nuts lately and by the way one thing that you have to wrap your head around is increasing your stops to accommodate the crazy volatility of the market and if you're trying to only risk a little bit of, of money i can guarantee you you're going to get knocked out and right now it seems like s p futures 
if you don't give him at least 30 points, you're going to get stopped out. And even on 30 points, you're going to get stopped out pretty quickly. And that's a lot, believe me, in futures. Now, are you angry with your spouse, your significant other, or, or both? And as I say, if you have both, then you might not want to be trading. I hope I don't lose too many clients by saying that. <laughs> Document your F-bombs. And I did have an F-bomb or two today. I, I was thinking around noon, I was going to brag to you guys and girls and say, hey, you know what? I didn't have one F-bomb today. On my best days, I have zero F-bombs. And when things aren't going well, I have a plethora of them. And it's very important to, to pay attention and be really cognizant of what you're doing. So I document it. I write it down. Okay. If I have an F bomb, I write it down. Put F, you know, on my trading journal. Where's my little F bomb? My desk is back to being a mess again. I need to get somebody to visit soon so I can clear that. Oh, here it is. <laughs> I should I should put a little stamp on the bottom of it with a little F and just stamp it on my, <laughs> in my trading journal. Now, one thing that's really helped me lately, it just amazes me is how these little simple, stupid things can help you so much. And it's like, oh man, I thought he's gonna tell me the Holy Grail tonight. But the reality is in the real world, little things like this can really help. Now, what of my rules it's not a hard and fast rule but it's something that i try to adhere to is especially in the intraday stuff if i'm entering a position intraday and it's going up and it's breaking out it's doing what i wanted to do i'm very tempted to just jump in at the market but i try to resist the temptation unless i really should already be in the market but i try to resist the temptation of jumping in at the market i put in a stop order above the market and if I get triggered in, I get triggered in. If I don't, I don't. And to my amazement, I have missed a ton of losing trades by doing that. And I started writing whew, in my trading journal and I was surprised at how many times I have written that recently. And I'd be willing to bet if I had jumped in on every one of those trades that or every or if I jumped into every one of those trades, instead of using a stop order, I'd be willing to bet I would be losing money this week and every other week since I started that. Now you got to watch the S and G trades, and if you are making an S and G trade, just make sure you document it as an S and G trade. FOMO is the same thing, so I'll write S and G. I'll write FOMO. S and G is a trade that you think, ah, it's just a little bit of risk. What the hell? I'm just going to take a little bit of risk. If it works, great. It might pay off okay. If it doesn't work, I don't care. I'll just sweep it under the rug. You know, kind of like what I did with, with Tesla yesterday, except that it, it became a lot bigger than that. Then I'm stuck in front of that screen, and I've got two hours of work ahead of me to do. All was started as somewhat of a, of a goad slash S and G type of trade. And it starts to kind of eat into my life. I had two hours of analysis ahead of me. My wife was expecting me home at, at a reasonable hour because I was cooking dinner to start dinner, you know. And so a lot of there's a lot more to it than just a trade in and of itself. And and kind of backing into something here, but it all goes back to all the lectures I've done about what's going on in your life and what's happening. That's kind of a small thing, like I'm okay, I'm in a hurry. I shouldn't have taken a trade to begin with. Now I'm looking to get out as soon as possible, as opposed to following some plan, which I didn't have to begin with. So just make sure you document what you're doing. And when you see something like FOMO or SG or something like that next to a trade, as soon as you put it on and then it goes awry, then you're like, okay, well, that's something that I shouldn't be doing. And I have one client in particular that I get goaded a lot from because <laughs> he's he's good at what he does but he plays a different game it's it, that's not me again you know and so I'll write his name down and put G-O-A-D after it so I know that I got into that trade and one thing I'm gonna tell you to do spoiler alert in a few minutes is to make sure you you review all this stuff and and I'd be willing to bet if I went in and and documented every one of those 
and put them in a spreadsheet or something with a, with a column, I'd be willing to bet that overall those trades lose money. Now, he seems to make money in it. And my FOMO was he's going to he's going to text me 20 minutes later and he's up 70 points. And lo and behold, he did, <laughs> you know, now I don't know where he got out. So hopefully he was able to keep some of that. One of my biggest problems is the walk in the office trade. And I had an epiphany yesterday with this. So to those who haven't heard me talk about this before, the walk in the office trade is my my office is now attached to the house. It used to be in a separate house, but it's attached to the house via a porchway. So I physically have to leave the house into the cold <laughs> or hot, whatever it is, usually hot, and walk over here. And one thing that I found is I'll walk in and everything just looks great, especially like an intraday stuff, right? And I'll end up firing off some trades. And then it took me a while to realize that the trades that I'm losing the most on are often those ones that I come in after leaving the office and coming back to the office. So I call it the walk in the office trade. So one of my commitment devices there, and we're going to talk a little bit about those in a few seconds, but one of my commitment devices there is I write W-I-T-O when I get back in the office and what time it is, okay? And then I try to do that first before placing any trades. And if, I play, if I'm getting ready to place a trade right after I walk in the office, I'm like, wait a minute, Dave. Is this a walk in the office trade and for some reason looks good? Now, my epiphany yesterday that I alluded to was the the hungry thing, right? So when do I leave the office? Lately, it hasn't been much, right? But now I leave the office for breakfast and I leave the office for lunch. So I come back from breakfast feeling good, feeling happy, nice and full. And like the judges, you know, feeling good, right? And after lunch, same sort of thing. So I really have to watch those walk in the office trades. Now, if you're not sure what to do, write that down and make sure you phrase it as a question. And I'm a big fan of questions and I've done presentation after presentation on the importance of asking questions, figuring out what question to ask and what's the uh, Keetering thing, what's his name? A problem well stated is a problem well solved. And that will come from asking questions. One thing that I'm guilty of sometimes is trading not to lose, or am I trading because I can win big, as opposed to trading to win big? And I'll give you an example. Let's say something is is about to break out or whatever, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna anticipate that breakout, and I'm gonna put in, I'm just gonna go ahead and get in. I'm putting a really, really, really tight stop just below the low, and it's not gonna cost me much. Well usually or many times i should say that trade will get away from me and it ends up costing me more than i intended and you got to be really careful when you're trading not to lose now there's there's various forms of trading not to lose if you try to trade s p futures over the last couple of weeks and you're trying to risk five points 10 points 15 points maybe 20 points because that's all you want to risk on a trade unless you've got that timing perfectly you are probably going to lose on that trade. Now, along the same lines, have you fully adjusted to the market's volatility? So just get that share size way, way down. I'm having one of my best weeks ever, and, and I don't want to brag because Friday I got cream, like I said, and, I, and you know, I, that's another one of my problems that you document. And when we get to another one of those, as we'll talk about in a second, I do have a bad habit of losing money on Fridays, it, it seems. I'm developing a pattern of that, okay? Is it because I'm in a good mood or what, you know, what, what's different on a Friday? Is the market more choppy on a Friday? I don't know. But I've been documenting that, I've been watching that, and maybe there are some procedures I need to put in place. Like maybe I need to go, <laughs> Maybe you need to leave the office on Fridays. But every now and then I hit it out of the park. So 
I can't just completely quit. Now, some of the things we talked about last week dovetails into this week, and I want to, in upcoming webinars, I want to elaborate on, on them quite a bit because I took a lot of notes in my morning pages, which, which I'm going to beat the dead horse on one more time, or again, I should say. And I didn't cover, I maybe covered about a third of what I want to cover on this, so we'll come back to it. But I was talking about the pain of missing out on a trade which is the reality versus the FOMO. And if you go in and watch last week's presentation, there's two different parts of your brain that are working. The, the part of you going into the trade is a certain part of your brain and the part of you in the tra trade is a different part of your brain. And have you ever like look forward to something and you just get all excited about it, excited about it, excited about it, you finally get that thing or do that thing and it's not nearly as great as you thought it was. Well, that's because two different parts of your brain are working on that. And one is reality and one is perception. Anyway, the Pascal's wager is this is your life on earth. That's in your that's your entire life right there. And for argument's sake, if God does exist, you end up with eternal bliss. I think he also talks about eternal damnation, but I don't want to think about that. <laughs> But that's his wager is, eh, why not give it a shot, you know? What's the worst can happen? I die, I'm like, damn it. Anyway, I had used that same analogy with a trade, but I wanted to make sure and follow up on that and make sure that that one little speck of a loss, provided it is, you thought it was the mother of all trades, and if you saw that trade tomorrow, you would take it again in a heartbeat. So, to follow up on that, is it truly a trader's wager, okay? Because on anything less than an F, yeah, trade, a loss could be more than a loss. And Douglas said this once, and I don't know, I had, as I've said before, I had some cassette tapes from him going way back in the day. And I'm rereading Discipline Trader now, and I would urge you to read that. Go to www.davelandry.com. Don't know who I am tonight, slash books dash two dash read. I'll put the link in post. Some of the links need updating because Amazon changed the way to do things, but you'll get the idea. But anyway, one thing that Douglas talked about is when you have a loss on a trade, it's often not the loss in and of itself, but the loss of every trade prior. Now, what does that mean? Well, I gave the example before many times. Uh, my youngest daughter, she wanted a dog and she got a dog. And then we ended up getting a second dog in a, during a moment of weakness. By the way, and I knew about two dog theory when we did this, but if you're living with a bunch of women, <laughs> you're the only man, you kind of cave in sometime. It is what it is. Anyway, long story endless. I know too late. We, my daughter would always forget to give the dogs water. And we were on her, on her, on her about it, on her about it, on her about it. Finally, on a Thursday night, Isabel, the dog needs water. The dogs need water. I'll do it in a little while. And Marcy says, my wife, Marcy, she says, if you don't give the dogs water tonight before you go to bed, if I come in here tomorrow when I wake up and you're at school, and these dogs should not have water, you're not going on your bus ride tomorrow. It was like a party bus or something, you know? And she forgot. And Marcy lost the cool. I kind of lost my cool too. And she didn't go to the party. She put she put us in a tough situation. Like Marcy says sometimes, parenting sucks. You know, you gotta... <laughs> but she never remembered to give the dogs water. So anyway... Marcy's reaction and my reaction to her not doing that would, from an outsider, would seem a little absurd. But the reality is, it was our reaction to everything prior to that. If you ever snapped at a loved one, I have a loved one snapped at you for something that aggravates them. It's not that one little thing, it's everything that led up to that. And that's one thing that you do have to wrap your head around with the psychology of trading is sometimes a loss can be more than just that loss. 
Now, getting back to the documentation and, and a little bit of the pre-mortem is why would the guy on the other end take the exact opposite trade? And every time I lose on a trade, I think, well, I guess he was smarter than me. He's not the greater fool, right? What would cause the most amount of pain in the most to the most amount of people? And this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately with this crazy volatility we've been having. Linda Rasky once said, and I asked her where I asked her where she got it, and she said, I don't know, it's probably a florism. She's very modest from back when she traded on the floor. Anyway, paraphrasing, the market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most amount of people. And a corollary that she said to that was the market will do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. So when I'm watching the market lately, I'm like, okay, what's gonna cause the most pain and most amount of people? And what's the obvious thing that it might do in an unobvious manner? And uh, for instance is market's in a really steep downtrend and it looks like it's gonna continue that downtrend, but what does it do first? It has the mother of all rallies first, sucking everyone in, okay? And then it sells off hard and spits them out. So I've been asking myself that question a lot lately as I'm taking my notes and watching the screen. So document, document, document. Now, I know I beat that dead horse on morning pages and um, hopefully there's nothing incriminating here. <laughs> but this is what I do every day. First thing when I wake up, I get my coffee first, of course, but it's really great. I mean, it gets, if you got stuff in your head, it gets it out. Um, you write three written, handwritten pages. And as I said before, I did these 20 something years ago, stopped doing them for whatever reason. And then in more recent times, I started reading a book by Julia Cameron. I didn't get past the first chapter where she said, do your morning pages. And I've been doing them for several, several years since. Anyway, just write three pages, write about whatever's going on. You know, if the dog farts, I write the dog just farted, you know, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't have to be uh, prose. Uh, what's, um, I'm trying to think of his name. Prost or whoever, Ernest Hemingway, or just write and get it out of your head. And, and you'll be surprised at how many things you'll resolve uh, from a, from a non-trading and a trading standpoint. You're going to find the things that you worry about, about 90% of them don't come true. And maybe it's 95%. And the five or 10% that do come true, you deal with it. And it's pretty amazing what you can deal with. Now, one thing it will do if you're writing day after day after day that, oh, I lost money again, I did something stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, it'll force you to realize or face the facts that are you Einstein or Churchill in these trades? Now, Churchill said success is going from one failure to another without any loss of enthusiasm. And if you are trading properly and you lose, you lose, you lose, guess what? You're getting closer to a winner. Like, as I say, nearly every <laughs> webinar, as Douglas once said, and I've got Douglas, Douglas in my head from reading his book, nearly finished another reread of it. And that's probably one you should reread every year. The, the disciplined trader that is. But anyway, he, he tells a story. Let me see if I can tell it as quickly as possible. I told it so many times, a bad salesman, makes a few sales calls, gets rejected, and goes drink his lunch. A good salesman makes a few sales calls, gets rejected, goes grab a cup of coffee, goes back to the phone, and knows that he's getting closer and closer to a sale. And if you're following a system properly, whether it's discretionary or not, and you know what you're doing, and you know a lot of this stuff all goes back to confidence. You're going to need a little confidence. You're going to need a little time. A year is not that long. I know some people are disgusted because they had a bad year. It's like, just relax, okay? And without going off a tangent, stop trying to do everything and just try to do one thing, do one thing good, and then do the next thing and the next thing. But anyway, provided you do have the confidence and you do have a conceptually correct methodology, 
then success truly is going from one failure to another without any loss of enthusiasm. However, if you find yourself doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, and you're writing it down day after day after day in your notebook, then you have become the definition of insanity by doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. So it will force you to kind of face some issues. And you do have to remember to go back and review those pages. Now, again, your trading journal is also an emotional journal, okay? It's not about where you got in and what happened and all, you know, put all that in there too. So you can go back and study it. And by the way, you can go back and study it, okay? And and that's the one point I really wanted to drive home tonight is make sure you go back and study it. I need to go back and look at these pages that I write, especially like go, I need to start going over the last week's pages to see what was in my head, what happened, what didn't, what worked, what didn't. I need to go back in and look at Friday and see what happened on Friday. I don't want to, <laughs> you know? But you really have to review those notes. So just the documentation is one part. The most important thing is to review the notes. So again, like I said, last Friday, really bad. I need to go back in and see what happened. And, and you know, at the end of the day, a lot of times, and it, it's it's kind of scary to go back in, especially when you did something really, really bad, right? Or, or, or things didn't work out well. But a lot of times you go in at the end of the day, it's like, oh, it wasn't that bad. And yeah, I would have taken that trade again. Okay, this was stupid, but it was only a small amount. I did honor my stop. and. I'll do that once, you know? <laughs> now, even on good days, and this is where the deliberate practice comes in, what could you have done better? So I had a good day today on the intraday stuff, um, but I took about three or four stabs at lab D and I think I scratched on overall and trade. And I think at the end of the day, if you look at it, it, it pretty much went up, you know? So how come I didn't make money on that? instead of patting myself on the back, because I made money on some other things like success and stuff, I need to look at what I did there and how to avoid the same mistake if it was a mistake to begin with. Now, if, if I look at my notes and it says, I'm just gonna take a stab at this and I'm willing to stop out, it might take a few stabs, then that's fine. I don't think I document it as such though. So practice deliberate practice, and that just means you're working to get better, constantly working to get better. Now, the another one of those things, I am guilty of doing those over and over again, but I started documenting them more and more and more. I don't have the manual nearby, but I did start one of those, what's her name, McInitty <laughs> manuals, you know, where she just would flip, 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 and she had to, she had to manage Trump. That, that can't be an easy job, right? So she had the big folder with all her answers ready, and one reporter's like, oh, you were ready for that one. It's like, well, yeah, you know, it's it's Trump. I, I, I have to be ready. You know, it's like, what do you think? I'm just coming here and weigh it? Anyway, so I got one of those manuals and I'm trying to use it more and more. And I have a tab for another one of those, okay? And I've been admitting some guilt throughout tonight and a lot of guilt lately. Uh, what, what if my another one of those is, okay, uh, on Fed days, be careful, you know? So I'm in here on Wednesday, yet again, okay, another one of those, right? You'll do that once, well, and I'm like, why is the market just chopping around so much? It just can't seem to trend for, for nothing. And then I notice in the Facebook group that someone said, <laughs> bed day, and I'm like, oh, God. so I need to put some sort of calendar alarm, reminder or something, that would be my commitment device there on Wednesdays when there's a Fed meeting or an announcement. So come up with some kind of commitment device to help you with those things. And thank you, baby Jesus, on that and Facebook group for showing me that. Now, of course, the, the hard question is, what could I have done better without the benefit of hindsight? Of course, right? And I think the more introspection you do with all this, the better and better you're going to get. And I tell you, it's like every day I have this epiphany. It's like, you know, trading is just in your head. And, you know, I'm like, duh, but it really is. And once you wrap your head around it and, and circling back to Douglas again and saying, okay, 
if there's fear in the trade, then you haven't accepted the risks going into that trade. And maybe you didn't have the confidence you needed going into that trade. The beauty of all that is you could work on that before you go into the trade, okay? And we talked a lot about this last week. I know I'm last weekend at band camp, you last week at band camp and you. But again, it's two different things, going into the trade and being in a trade, okay? Two completely different things, two completely par different parts of your brain. So just know that once you get in that trade, you could be subject and you will be subject to the fear of loss or the fear of a gain evaporating, which would cause you to micromanage and take profits too soon. Just know there will be blood and know that it's going to be difficult once you're in it, a lot more difficult than going into the trade. And again, I explained that in a lot more detail last week, so check that out and in prior presentation. So what commitment devices can you put into place? I, again, just little stupid things. It amazes me how little stupid things can help. And I guess you're probably noticing what's uh, Ankara, Amparo, or something like that, like uh, Michelangelo said when he was 80-something, allegedly. I'm still a work in progress. I think we're all a work in progress. And that's why I get so pissed off when I see these these uh, these Yahoo gurus. By the way, it's so funny. It's like all these gurus are so smart with all this crypto, and now their strategy is to hodl, <laughs> hold on for dear life. I'm like, really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway, uh, commitment devices. I'll give you a, a simple one that I started, and maybe these could be procedures too. But I dedicated one screen, one thirty. Four inch monitor. I have one. I don't. I don't want to count them. I got too many. <laughs> it's a sickness. But I, I had you know, years ago when I was doing the computers and stuff. I, I always had more than one computer. Just a computer guy, a computer nerd back then. But I, but I committed one monitor during the day just to the daily ETFs that I like to watch. The four daily ETFs because I would get so pissed off when two things would happen. One, I would get chewed up on an intraday trade, and then at the end of the day, I would look at the daily on that and go, well, Dave, you big dummy, it was an inside day. It just stayed within that little bit of a range. And two, if I got in and out or micromanaged or just missed it entirely, and I'd see a big fat bar on the daily chart, it would really upset me. So I did put a, all four during the day, I keep them on one screen and every now and then I'll walk over to them, take a look at them, kind of gets pulls me away from from the, you know, being drawn into the screen, <laughs> the, the trading station, and just take a look at those to see where I am and which ones I really should be in, which ones might be making an opening gap reversal, which ones are still inside days, et cetera. And by the by the way, another one of these things I'm just thinking as I'm I'm doing it right uh, live here. Is as I talked about before, Holy Grail Day. If you could figure out how to capture Holy Grail Days, in fact, if I could figure out how to capture Holy Grail Days and only trade on Holy Grail Days, you would never see my fat ass again because it, that's why I call it Holy Grail Day. Holy Grail Day starts at one end and ends at the other, and it makes a nice wide range bar. The widest bar, say, for like seven to 10 days. And you could make a lot of money on those Holy Grail Days. However, on the choppy days, and you're almost guaranteed to make money on a Holy Grail day. Sometimes, you know, obviously it happens, right? But the problem becomes, as I am painfully aware, is getting chewed up in between. So one commitment device that I have created is I have a little formula, and I forgot the exact formula. I'm not teasing you. I've, I've got it somewhere. I, I, well, I have it in, in Think or Swim. I could pull it up. And I'm looking at today's range, just high minus low, the actual daily range, not the average true range. And I'm comparing it to the longer term range to see what percentage I'm in. And I've actually walked through this in prior presentations too. Anyway, the point is that if it's gonna be if it's gonna move a hundred percent of its widest range over the last seven to ten bars, whatever it is, it's gonna have to move 50% first. And it seems like if it doesn't move at least 50 percent 
it's still chopping around and it might not be worth going after. Now, of course, sometimes you can buy the high tick with this filter, okay, of 50, at least 50%, provided it's not a gap, that's an opening gap reversal play type of thing or a gap and go, a little bit different, a little bit more complex. But in general, if you got an inside day, let's say you got an inside day and it's just kind of chopping around and the range is only 20% or 10% or whatever, then maybe you want to sit on your hands and that and that's kept me out of a lot of bad trades. And it's everyone wants to know the secret to trading and the, and the greatest patterns in the world, and the greatest setups. But the real secret is knowing when not to trade. And yes, you do have the greatest setup and it is the time it is time to trade. But more important than that is the filter to try to stop you from trading too much. I know, figure it out, write me a letter. <laughs> So again, I'm going to circle back to last week's show. I would suggest you go back and watch last week's show. I'll put a link in post below this if you're watching on YouTube, so you can check it out. All right, Facebook post of the week is from CJ. Get ready for Fed Day when they usually screw up your pretty charting landscape. Beautiful, beautiful post. And it's it's it's. I guess it's my favorite post of the week, not the post that I think is the best for everyone, but this exemplifies the fact that we have traders out there and we're watching the markets and this may have saved my life, okay? On Wednesday, and Wednesday was okay. That's another thing I'm gonna try to do and we'll see how long I do it. So I had the, the equity numbers handy here. I wanna make sure I'm, I'm keeping up with those daily because if I start going in a hole, I need to figure out what's going on. And if, if there's anything anything wrong, or what's wrong, if anything, is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, he gets post of the week because it was the post that helped me personally out the most. And hopefully some of you other guys shared that. But again, it just shows that we kind of got each other's back. And somebody was kind enough to say, thank you, CJ, hey, it's a possible get ready for a possible crazy day. <laughs> Regarding another one of those, sometimes I write things, this was left over from last week, but I do find myself when I get around to finally reviewing my notes is I do write a lot of the same things down, just kind of like I beat the dead horse in these presentations, right? And it does become the definition of insanity, like I need to find a procedure or just stop doing that. This has been a godsend for me, especially in more recent times, is look at the charts and not the equity. If you look at how much money you made or lost, it's really gonna mess with your head. But if you're looking at the charts and you're doing the right thing, and I know I'm doing a little mental calculations in my head all day long, but I'm trying to just look at the charts and and try not to stare at that equity screen. I used to keep my equity screen as one screen up all day. Now I keep that I keep charts in front of it, and only when I have to, I look at it. And even when I do that, I try not to look at what the equity is. Now, one thing I was thinking about, kind of a random thought here, is obviously you can't get a little bit pregnant. But does allowing for the occasional SNG trade kind of scratch the itch? If you're kind of itching to make a trade or something, is it okay to take that little SNG trade or does that lead to more and more and more bad behavior? And I'm kind of throwing that out. But I do write SNG when I take an SNG trade. And I'm wondering um, if I went back and added those up, if it would be actually worthwhile. So. As I talked about earlier, getting back to like Douglas, sometimes a losing trade is much more than just a loss in and of itself. And so can that S and G trading manifest into something much bigger or much bigger bad, or is it okay to kind of scratch the itch? And, and I don't have the answer to that and I'd be happy to discuss it. If you're on YouTube, leave a comment below and, and for everybody who's here tonight, who, who I think is also on Facebook, we could uh, talk about there. Crypto Corner, not a whole lot to say here, other than it's in a bear market. Everything I've been saying for months is in this slide here. So rather than go through all this, we'll just pop up to the charts real quick. 
and take a look at some of these things. So let me just shift gears real quick. Any questions, anything so far, any comments? And we'll go to We'll get trading you up and running. So one thing I've been preaching, and you can go back in, and I said this months and months ago, and I just think it's cool when I see something like this actually work out. But if you go in and look at crypto, and this goes pretty much for any other market, I would imagine. But like I've been saying, the um, 30 day EMA is your best friend. So Landry Light would mean that the lows, I'm sorry, the highs in this case are below the 30 EMA. So as you look through these, just look at where the 30 EMA is and look at what price is relative to it, okay? And as a general statement, don't buy any market on a daily basis at least, if it's not above the 30 EMA. So you can see we are in a horrible, except for that one, a horrible bear market in crypto. And I think we've been in a bear market for quite a while. In fact, it, it started last Thanksgiving and last Thanksgiving I think was one of the best days I ever had in crypto and it's been downhill ever since. So pretty interesting that in spite of all the excitement about crypto, that it's in a lot of trouble. Let's take a look at Bitcoin real quick. You can see Bitcoin's in a pretty serious downtrend. And we just had one little kiss of the 30 EMA, and that was, that's going all the way back to when did it top out? November 9th, November 10th, actually, was the all-time high. 70-something thousand, and now it's in the 30s, okay? So it's looking pretty ugly. And I wish I would have gotten around to completing it and publishing it, but I started a 10 things that concern me about crypto article in my head and in my morning pages. And I've got seven so far. And I wish I would have fleshed it out and published it long before all this happened. But adding to that, one of the new concerns now is it's kind of funny how things are coming out on the downside, on the negative side. It's, it's kind of fascinating because all the buzz was how great everything is. And I'm still a bull longer term on Bitcoin, but I wouldn't rush out and, and bet the forum on her now. Wait at least until it's above the 30-day EMA if you're thinking about buying into it. But it seemed like Ethereum had a really good use case. And all of a sudden, recently, there's some negative things that are coming out about Ethereum. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it sounds like there might have been a little insider shamming going on with this to where a lot more insiders own it than what's been reported. And there were some documents that were tweeted out or whatever that were supposed to stay confidential, I'm guessing. Anyway, so that's a concern with Ethereum, but you can see Ethereum has gone from 5,000 down to 2,500. And I was a bull on Ethereum, and now I'm not so much. Of course, as a trader, I would not be going after Ethereum or Bitcoin or pretty much any of the rest of these. So, you know, one thing too, and I'll get around to talking about this eventually, but like the bloom is definitely off the rose. Like here's one of the doggy coins, sheep. I actually absolutely printed money on this way back last October and then stopped out. And I was thinking, oh, I'm gonna I'm just a hold a billion of these things forever, right? See what happens. Well, <laughs> the trader in me is just nah, can't do it. But you can see it's one of these doggy coins and not doing so hot like the rest of stuff. All right. Jess Jeff says probably one use case in crypto is that you could have the function use blockchain without the coin part. Good point, good point. I need to kind of wrap my head around that a little bit. Yeah, I guess the technology can can be done. Um, 
what does the coin part you know I, I know like the gaming ones it's like you can win the coins or something and uh yeah i need to wrap my head around that a little bit maybe we'll take that up in uh, facebook a little bit more but that makes sense uh it really does okay any anybody want any crypto you guys want to look at for shift gears okay while i'm waiting waiting on questions and as i say we don't get as many questions now that we're in facebook all day Here's the TFM 10% system, and I zoomed it in so you could see. We closed at 4326, if, if I can read that, and 4289 would be right above the buy line, and the buy line is set at 90% of the 50 week closing high. Okay. And this is just a 50 week simple moving average. So let's take a look at this longer term without going into the, I beat the dead horse on this system. So just let's just take a look. Let's see if it'll go 10 years on a weekly. So you look to get long when it's above the buy line and above the 50 week EMA, you have two lows above the 50 week EMA. And any close below the 50 week, I said EMA, simple moving average. This one's actually simple. Any close below the simple moving average and a close below the buy line will signal a exit. So the exit was before the pandemic really kicked into gear. Okay. Market slid about, I think it was 28% from the sell signal. And then you buy back here, actually 1% or 2% higher. So that was a whipsaw. So what? You were able to sleep through a 30% drop. I have a friend that's gonna visit me on Saturday from out of town. And he was in a bit of a panic when he was down 30% and he wasn't getting much sleep. I can tell you that right now with this buy and hope mantra, okay? Now, what's worse, losing, losing well, okay, 30% from the signal or missing a one or 2% opportunity cost? And that's where I think market timing is very important. By the way, since we're on a weekly here, it doesn't look that ugly on the S&P. You know, I've been looking at the, at the, I guess the trees and not the forest too much lately. But when you back this chart out, it doesn't look all that bad, right? But if we do close below the buy line, which would mean that we have dropped 10% from the closing high, which would be right here, then we might need to get out the way. So you can see this is the, this is how far the market dropped during the pandemic. This is looking back 50 days, okay? So obviously if you go to a bear market, these numbers get really, really, really ugly. Where do you exit? Well, you would get out on this particular signal, would have been like right here, okay? Right below the buy line and right below, and also below the 50 week moving average, okay? That was a bear market, bull market. Where would you get in? You get in here, okay? Where would you get out? You get out here. Now I'm shocked that something so simple could work so well. And here's the deal too. If you go in and look at the presentation I did for stock charts this week, which will be on my website tomorrow on Friday, I put the spreadsheet up. I know you want to part it with me. And I'm pretty impressed with the results. It's more of a market timing. It's more of not trying to beat the market, but not letting the market beat you. Like my buddy that's gonna visit, he would have slept a lot better as that market went down day after day after day after day and day and finally bottomed out after it was down 40% or whatever and started going back up again. But anyway, it's simple little system. I can't believe how simple it is and how it actually works. But keep in mind that all trend following systems, longer term like this, are going to look a lot the same and perform a lot the same. And also, by the way, one thing I've been meaning to say, I keep forgetting to say is you're not going to make money if you're trying to like trend follow in the S&P futures over the somewhat intermediate term because they really don't trend that well, okay? Markets tend to chop around a lot. But if you're willing to go much, much longer term and use a system like this, a simple little system, then it'll help to keep you in the right side of the market. And the other thing I want to say too is don't necessarily look at this one system in and of itself 
but do pay attention when you get that cell signal, okay? And and do pay attention when you're getting close to a cell signal. You certainly want to pull in your horns a little bit, okay? All right, let's hop over to the overall market. And I said I'd have a lot to say about that, but there's really, you're going to see all the charts pretty much look the same with a few exceptions, and I'll show you those. All right, so let's go over to, let's go over here to TC. And let me see if I can get bow ties to work with this. I'm getting hungry. And how do you get uh how do we get the other ones? Maybe bow tie two. <laughs> All right, let's start with the P's. Okay. Here's the bow ties. And they're now in downtrend proper order, meaning that the 10 is less than 20, less than 30. And if you look up here, you'll see 10 is simple. 20 is exponential, 30 is exponential. I know I say that every time, but as soon as I end this webinar, I'm going to get a question. What are those moving averages? <laughs> so, so technically, we do have a bow tie. We do have the higher high and the higher low. So any, if it takes out this low here, it'd be the trigger. I'd be a little bit more lenient. But tomorrow, let's see where we close. If we close below the level, that 10% line, that would be a sell signal. And by the way, no guarantees. But if you got out of the market after it dropped 10% and was also below the 50 week moving average, you would have avoided every bear market in history. At least the ones that were, well, yes, that's just a fact, okay? But there's no guarantees in this business, but that is something that so far, you know, past results don't guarantee future results. NASDAQ composite, looking pretty ugly in here, closed at a new closing low, and you can go back quite a bit. I need to get a mouse with a wheel. But you can see all the way back to, way back to last May. So that's ugly. And the thing to think, the thing to think about, as I was explaining earlier, were like T and DM. Anybody who bought from this level here all the way up to this level here is now beginning to feel some pain, okay? These people might need money, and that's just the way it is, unfortunately. So they might have to sell stocks. Take a look at the Rusty. Rusty's ugly. Rusty was in a stupid range forever, tried to get out, and then imploded. Now, you've probably heard me say this before, and it's it's hard to time a market off of this, but it's a good thing to just kind of file away. If a market makes a base and breaks out, okay? And then it comes back in and takes out the bottom of the base, it'll actually test out. Now, by test out, I think that's just my empirical research. And I talked about this leading into this rusty possibly taking out the bottom of its range. It would be ugly. And so far, it's been pretty ugly. What level of spy is the 10% line? Okay, I'll do that for you. Let's see if we can get back to it real quick. Bear with me. All right, so we'll put the spy in here. All right, so in spiders, good question, Craig. Thank you. Yeah, it's at uh, 427.46. And all that is, is 90% of this closing high right here. Okay, that's it. And that's all it does. And by the way, you can adjust this now in ACP if you have ACP. And one thing I did, and I posted this in Facebook, was I was messing around with it, going to like 30% for something crazy like Bitcoin. And what was interesting is if you change to like 95%, and only get long if you're at like 95%, it'll help you avoid a lot of chop that never materializes into trend. And hopefully that made some sense. And we could we could flesh that out in the comments over time if you like, or in Facebook tomorrow. I have some posts. They are ready. All right, let's get back to the market real quick. Rusty, ugly, okay? About the only good looking area, I'll take that back. The only two good looking areas are energies and foods. I'm not too excited about the foods, but I do like the energies. And we're long, I can never remember the symbol, K L Y E, got whacked today. 
but it was doing pretty good for a while there. Still looks pretty good though, longer term. Anyway, energy's new closing high today, although they're off their best levels. About the only area other than the foods, kind of hard to get excited about the foods, but it is what it is. If we have to start trading foods, we'll trade foods. But you can see even the foods kind of stalled out a little bit in here. And you can see those moving averages are beginning to roll over. The rest of the market just looks ugly. Durables banged out new lows today. You see your bow tie here. Let's see where the trigger was. Uh, higher high. Well, technically not higher high and higher low, but just a higher high. But yeah, for all intents and purposes, bow ties triggered there. Banks are a bit of a bummer because banks were defying gravity, sold off hard. They're trying to rally and now they're stalling out short of their prior highs. By the way, with the overall market, the market can run up quite a bit and still be in trouble. So be careful on that retrace rally until it looks like it's gonna become more than just a retrace rally. And as a trend follower, sometimes you just have to wait and see, see what happens. You can't be a hero. Financial services looking pretty ugly, kind of looks like the peas themselves. Drugs just off of all time, not all time, but a multi-month lows looking pretty ugly. Biotech banged out new lows today. As you can see, new closing lows there, remaining in a downtrend. Notice the proper order in all these. Also notice the Landry light, beating the highs are less than these moving averages, especially the 30, which I like to pay attention to. Here's retail looking pretty ugly in here. So all these areas look poised for new leg lower. The only problem is we're still pretty oversold. So I wouldn't be a hero just yet. I like to see a bit of a bounce before doing any more shorting. Semiconductors, multi-year lows. This bums multi-month lows. This bums me out. Hopefully these multi-year lows I keep saying is not a Freudian slip, but this bums me out. I like to see the semis kind of hang in there and confirm what's going on with the overall market when it's going up, of course. So Kind of no place to run, no place to hide. Interesting dollars doing pretty good in here, in spite of everything, okay? Inter, uh, intermarket analysis all goes up with metals. See Paul, for example. Okay, I'll give you that. And oil also goes down when the dollar goes up. But oil, but what did, um, what's oil in here? It's been so long since I plotted it. Um, Gold is GLD. It looks like a bad tick. Yeah, palladium has been uh, going up quite a bit. Now, keep in mind, if the dollar goes down, these commodities will go up because they're dollar denominated, okay? So that's pretty much the market. It's ugly. <laughs> it's pretty ugly. How's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron? All right, any, any stock picks you guys want to look at? I know we talk about things all day, not that last week at Bandcamp again with Facebook, but I'm proud of the group, I really am. And I lurk a lot, so a lot of times you're thinking I'm not here. I am. <laughs> all right, going once, going twice. Well, I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. Obviously, again, I'm humbled that you would take time out of your busy schedule to be here. I know how life is, especially lately with crazy markets and everything else going on. Anything unanswered, you can reach me at DaveLander.com slash contact. And everybody have a great weekend and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. Cheers. You're welcome.